Good morning and welcome to worship from Tillicutry Parish Church Manse for Sunday the 27th of September. It's good to have you with us wherever you're worshipping from. Just a wee bit of information about what lies ahead of us. Next Sunday morning, on online and on disc as has become our custom, we will be celebrating together in Harvest Thanksgiving. We won't be doing so in the church, we will be doing so in our own homes, but you are invited to consider making donation either of food or of money, either direct to Tillicutri Baptist Church for the local food bank or to the gate in Aloha. Um, we cannot receive anything here, but if you would like to arrange to make a donation yourself as a thanksgiving gift, I know it would be very gratefully received. We've been working very hard here in the parish church, preparing to unlock the church once more and reopen for worship. That process has begun. The presbytery has given us approval um, to open using the plans that we have presented to them. And we are now in the process of developing a team of duty personnel. And at present, we are providing them with an opportunity to worship and learn how to make sure we keep all of you safe as you return to your pews. We will be returning in very small numbers. We anticipate that we will begin services sometime in October for the congregation. We will be able to accommodate only 20 people, including myself, at those services. Over time, we will be able to increase that a bit, but please be patient with us. We will remain online. Sundays will stay online. The services in the church will be on a Tuesday morning. We know that won't suit everyone, but we've had to make some very difficult decisions about how to do this. And the Kirk Session has decided that Tuesday at 11 is a good time to make sure that those who've been unable to access services online get the first chance to worship God together. But for now, we are blessed that we can worship even in our homes. Let us worship God.
The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. Let us turn our eyes from the routine of our lives to the one who offers us his peace. Let us pray. Ever knowing God, you watch over us, caring for us at all times. You know our very thoughts, our words and our deeds. And we praise you that such is your love for us. Father, we turn from the world which places so many demands upon us and turn to you who watches over us at all times. As we seek you now, help us to lay down the burdens we carry, the concerns that fill our hearts and minds, the distractions which make it difficult for us always to understand that you are near. Forgive us that we are so weak that we find it difficult to offer you the same attention you give us. Forgive us that we're not always good examples of what it means to be your servants. Renew us in the knowledge that with you, it's not what we have been that counts, but what we seek to be here and now with your aid. So lead us in our worship, that in your presence now we may be refreshed and renewed for the days that lie before us. We make our prayer in the name and for the sake of him who taught us to pray and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We hear now our reading, read this morning by Ian Scott. This morning's reading is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to each of the interests of the others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Do everything without grumbling. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfil his good purpose. Amen. And thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. 
Paul had a deep affection for the people of the church of Philippi. But sometimes they worried him. Sometimes he felt that they just didn't quite grasp what it meant to be Christ's church. Sometimes he was troubled in case they were losing their way as the people of God. His worries stemmed from the fact that they didn't always seem as united as he would expect them to be and as they should be. He worried, as most ministers do at some stage in their ministry, that the people he was trying so desperately hard to serve, to encourage and nurture, were singing from a different hymn sheet to the one that he was holding and reaching out to them with. When Paul looked at the church at Philippi, he saw good people of strong faith, but sometimes of strong personalities too. And sometimes those personalities got in the way of their faithfulness. And it almost seemed as though they were all jostling for power. The church, even to this day, can sometimes feel like that, can't it? These past few months have been the strangest of times for all of us. As I said to you at the beginning of this service, we are now in the process of reopening the church. And one of the things that has been most encouraging to me has been seeing how people have pulled together both here in Tillicoutry and at Logie Kirk, where I'm interim moderator. They've worked together to make sure that we can open for worship, setting aside self and focusing on the most important thing, which is that once more, God's people will be able to enter the sanctuary set apart within their own parish to worship God together. What I've experienced these past few weeks is the exact opposite of what Paul seems to be identifying. He seems to be de describing a church in which folk were wanting to be recognised as the best contributors, the most faithful, they're truly involved. He was looking at a church in which such attitudes ran the risk of destroying its very life. And he pointed them instead in the direction they needed to look, to Jesus. The theologian Tom Wright talks of an opportunity when a friend of his invited him and another couple of dozen folk to join him for lunch. His friend welcomed them all, said grace, and then said to them, Now, as we gather for this meal, please remember that the most interesting person in the room is the person sitting next to you. That's quite a telling comment, isn't it? And perhaps an important one for us as Christ's people at this time to think about. These past months have isolated us from one another in ways we've never experienced before. From my perspective, at the beginning of lockdown, I witnessed and experienced incredible selfless acts of generosity and kindness. But as time has gone by, in many ways, these have been overshadowed by a growing sense of, but what about me? with selfishness and thoughtlessness creeping in. I want has become more prominent. I want my freedom back. I want to meet who I wish to, whenever and wherever I want. I don't want restrictions. I don't have the virus. Why can't I go on holiday and come back and get on with life? I want my life back. 
I want my life back and you want yours. But the truth is, our lives never went away. They just changed and they will never be the same again. But what people need to get their heads around is that though things have changed forever in ways that have been completely beyond our control, each one of us has the power to determine whether we can make that change for better or worse. I would like to think that at the end of this, I'm a better person for it. But that will only happen if I recognise I'm not the most important person in the equation and get over it. In Paul's time in the world of ancient Rome and Greece, people were used to having people to put on pedestals, inspiring leaders like Alexander the Great and the Emperor Augustus. But these were just human beings who by power and might gained the fear and the respect of their people and became almost deified. In a world like that, what chance did a human carpenter from Nazareth have of being looked up to? And yet that's exactly what Paul was saying. This man whom you follow isn't like the leaders the world respects and treats as God. The man you follow is God. And he took the decision to step out into the danger and the challenge of our world. This man you're called to imitate and serve chose to leave the comfort of heaven, recognising that to truly demonstrate what it means to be God is to set aside all the right that that entails, to become broken and crucified for the sake of the world. If we as Christians are to make a difference in the world in the days that lie ahead, we, like Tom Wright at that lunch party, need to understand that the most important person in the room isn't ourselves, but the one we sit with. And the one with whom we are privileged to sit, even in the darkest days, isn't ourselves, or our dearest family, or our closest friends. The one who has conquered the power of sin and death can sit with us always, no matter where, no matter when. As we sit with him, he recognises us and wants us to know how important we are to him. And in turn, we are invited to recognise that the one who can truly make a difference to how we live through these times and beyond is the one who humbled himself allowed himself to suffer and die and rose again to allow us not only to glimpse but to know the power of the risen Christ.
Let us pray. In tender compassion, Lord, you look upon your wayward children. But even as you watch over us, we turn from you and hide. You listen to our every cry and respond in love. Yet even as you reach out in comfort, we seek our solace in earthly values. And yet, Lord, we know that you alone understand us, for you created us. And so we dare, even in our weakness, to bring our prayers to you. Because you make us unique, we each bring our different concerns and we offer these to you now in silence. We pray for the world and all that worries us. We pray for those who can make a difference to how the world runs. We pray for our nation. For our families and friends. For those who give us cause for concern, hurt or fear. For your children gathered wherever they are this day. You watch over us and listen. So meet us, Lord, in our need and enrich our lives that we may live this and every day as your blessed children. Amen. God has all the time in the world for you. May you in turn seek to find time for him in your living. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon and remain with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>